In this video, I'm going to give you 25 tips to living on a tiny income that just about anyone can use immediately. Coming up next on Holy Schmidt. Holy Schmidt. This video is going to give you 25 tips on how to live on a very small, even tiny income in retirement or in life, really, for that matter. Stick around to the end because the last point yields $55,600 on average for 20% of the American population. All right, let's go. Let me begin by answering the question, what constitutes a tiny income? We're going to use the federal guidelines for poverty. In this case, in 2023, someone who's single, the poverty line is $14,580 for a couple of two $19,720. You have two currencies in your life. The first, which is quite common and unspectacular, is money. The second, which is far more valuable, is time. And people are trading these two their entire life without knowing that time is a currency. During your working life, time is fleeting. During your retirement years, time is plentiful. We're going to use the fact that you have a lot of time on your hands to make the most of your retirement income. Number one, develop a retirement budget. There's a reason that people have budgets and that's because they work. This is easier than you think. My upcoming video, How to Automate Your Retirement Budget in 15 Minutes and the accompanying spreadsheet will be out in just a couple of weeks and anyone can find 15 minutes once a month to manage their budget. This will be simple to use and totally free. So make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications so that you get alerted when that video comes out. As I said, it will be out in a few weeks. The next tip, build a cushion fund ASAP, even if it means taking on a part-time job. A cushion fund is often mistaken for an emergency fund, which by definition is used just for emergencies. An emergency fund is used for things like a broken pipe that floods your basement, a new radiator needed for your car, and similar big costs that all of a sudden shock you and you weren't expecting. A cushion fund can be used for emergencies and at some point in the future you will combine the two, but it's there to help you to get the best price on your purchases by improving your buying time and helping you avoid penalties. One month is all you need to get started. That's why a part-time job or some source of income available for the cushion fund is so important. I'll show you how to use the cushion fund later and that one month will turn into two and then to three and then to four and so on. The next point, shop with a list and stick to it. According to Fortune Magazine, Americans waste about one third of the food that they purchase. That's an equivalent of 1,250 calories per day. The reason is simple. Our eyes are bigger than our stomachs as my mom used to tell me, and we simply go to the store and we overbuy. Obviously, this is a mistake on so many levels, but if you are living on a tiny income, this can be huge if you can get it under control. The next point is cancel your cable. If you're like most Americans, you haven't looked at your cable in months, yet you pay for a cable box and cable service. If this is you, canceling your cable will save you 50, 60, 70, $80 or more per month, depending on the type of plan that you have. And of course, you're probably using a streaming service, so you're paying for both a streaming service and cable, and functionally, they do very similar things. The next point, if your bank charges you a monthly fee, move banks. There are enough banks out there that value your business and won't charge you a monthly fee for your checking account, your savings account, and other services. And in this day and age, with all of the banks out there, you don't need to pay for a bank that doesn't treat you well. The next point is pay off your credit card. In fact, this is probably job one for many of you if you have ultra high balances because that's sucking all of your cash flow out of your checking account and out of your life. The reason that interest rates are so high on credit cards, by the way, is that a lot of people don't pay their credit cards. So if you're someone who does pay your credit card, you're effectively paying for somebody else's bad habits. The next point is to quit smoking. Now, I didn't put this first because it's an obvious one, but I will say the average smoker spends $309 per month on smoking. This is before all of the other obvious points like a longer life, lower medical costs, and general healthy well-being. The next point is to use an online pharmacy for your prescriptions. Now, you'll have to do the work yourself and compare the cost at an online pharmacy compared to your local pharmacist, but in many cases, the savings is substantial. Online pharmacies don't have to pay for big rents, for a vast number of staff, 
and other costs that are not there when you have an online business. This helps them save money. And frankly, the people who buy their pharmaceuticals online expect a lower price. So it has to work. Otherwise, they won't switch. The next point, check your medical and hospital bills for errors. This happens more often than you think. And frankly, insurance companies often pay you if you discover errors in the billing. The next point is rent versus buy anything that you're only going to use once or twice. My favorite example is movies. People invariably want to own a movie instead of rent it because they think that they're going to watch it over and over again, but rarely do they do that. There will be exceptions to this, of course. My family loves watching Top Gun Maverick. We've watched it over six times, but for every Top Gun, there are dozens of movies that you think you're going to watch again that you never do. Now apply the same methodology to something that you think that you want to own, but can't really justify it and rent it instead. Next, do the research and find a lower priced mobile phone plan. They're definitely out there for most people and then switch. My guess is that when you go to cancel your phone plan, your current carrier will find a far better deal and then you'll have to make the decision, but at least you have the option to lower your cost either where you're at or with a new carrier. The next point is dine in versus eat out. This also helps with the earlier point on shopping with a list and wasted food. Next, cancel unused subscriptions. For most people, this will save them at least $50 a month, but for others, it will save them much, much more. Here's why. Most subscription plans offer a discount for the first three months or six months, whatever the time period is. And at the end of that period, the price goes way up. If you're the seller, you hope that the customer is going to love the product or the service and will pay the higher price. If you're the customer, you're going to see it on your credit card bill and ignore it most of the time, at least for a few months until it bothers you to the point where you're going to cancel it. When you move to cancel it, undoubtedly, like the mobile phone plan, they will give you a remarkable deal to stay. But if you've made the decision to cancel because you're not using it, you're still not using it no matter how little it costs. So it pays most of the time to just cancel it anyway. Next, don't buy the book, check it out at the local library. The fact is, unless it's a brand new book, there's a very good chance that that book you want to buy is available at your library. So exercise that library card and check out the book. The next point, free entertainment is often the best. Watch a parade, go on a picnic, have friends over for a board game, perhaps with wine and cheese, and then switch houses. Next, take public transportation instead of Uber or a taxi. Oftentimes it's more quick and it certainly is about 10% of the cost of the ride in most cases. Next, buy your airline ticket long in advance and stay over on a Saturday. The savings can be remarkable if you do it in this way. Next, don't drink bottled water. It's incredibly expensive and it's not good for the planet. Instead, drink filtered water. It tastes exactly the same in most cases. Next, comparison shop online before you go. One of the best ways to do this, by the way, is to simply put in the product name and the three stores that you want to shop at, three stores near you. For example, if you type in price of Campbell's chicken noodle soup, just as an example, CVS, ShopRite, Target, into your search engine and hit return, you'd be surprised at what comes back. By the way, this works for big purchases as well. Next, use the quick change oil and lube service around the corner instead of the full service garage or your dealership. The savings can be multiple times in this case. Next, know that homes can be plain on the outside and amazing on the inside and that you live on the inside of the home. This next one doesn't get a lot of airplay, but it's really important. And that is refurbish instead of buying new when it makes sense to do so. Let me explain. You could go out tomorrow and buy entirely new mechanicals for your aging units in your home but sometimes it makes sense to have someone come in and refurbish those units instead of replacing them. On the flip side, sometimes it just makes sense to buy something new because frankly, the cost to replace it is cheaper than the cost to refurbish it or the savings difference long-term is much better with a new unit. Now I have a question for you. What is the fastest depreciating asset that you own? Well, for many of you, your mind went right to your automobile and that would be close but not the fastest depreciating asset. Automobiles are front loaded with their depreciation, but utilization is linear, meaning that your car can be fully depreciated over six years, but it can have a life of 10 or more. 
but the absolute fastest depreciating asset that you own are your clothes. Now, I'm not talking about the big dog t-shirt that you bought at the beach last summer. It had no value then, and it has no value now, except for sentimental value. I'm talking about suits, blazers, ties, nice shoes, and for the ladies, cocktail dresses, skirts, and other expensive stuff. Now, if you're saying, Jeff, I'm retired. I don't need that type of clothing anymore. Well, then you can skip to the next one. But before you skip ahead, in the future, do you plan to go to any weddings, funerals, big parties, 4th of July celebrations, bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, church, temple, confirmations? <sighs> you get the point. For the vast majority of you, the answer is yes. At some point in the future, you're going to need to have a seam hemmed, a button replaced, something let out, or some other alteration. And for that, you need a great tailor. Now, a great tailor can save you money in so many ways. They will keep your extraordinary clothes looking extraordinary. And here's the money part of this. Deep down inside, do you want to live your entire retirement in a pair of board shorts and the big dog t-shirt? My guess is probably not every single day. Deep down you don't, grace and beauty is also part of retirement. Also, a great tailor can take cheap clothes and make them really nice. Now, I often joke about shopping at Old Navy, but I do shop there, frequently in fact. Untucked shirts look better if they're level at the bottom instead of having that half circle. Jeans look better if they are cut to the right length. You get the point. Ultimately, you need far less clothes if you love the clothes that you own. Next, take a staycation on your next vacation and explore the closest big city as if you were a tourist. The main expenses of going on vacation, hotels, and flights will be non-existent. Now, here's a statistical fact. 50% of all gift cards go unused. It's great for the retailer, bad for the customer. But the fact is, if you have gift cards in your house, there's a good chance that some of them are already expired and others are getting ready to expire. So either re-gift or use them. It's free money. Next, have an energy audit on your home. Many utilities will do this for free. And something as simple as plugging the gap on your front door can save your energy bill 20% or more in some cases. Finally, the point I made at the beginning, track down your abandoned 401k. Now, you say, I don't have an abandoned 401k. The question is, are you sure? One in five people do, and they don't know it. And the best part of an abandoned 401k and the worst part is that it will probably come from early on in your life. You may have contributed a few thousand dollars and forgot about it, but that few thousand dollars continued to grow and grow and grow. The average abandoned 401k has $55,600 sitting in it, and one out of five people have an abandoned 401k, one out of five Americans in this country. The easiest way to find your old 401k is just to contact your previous employer, but sometimes old employers are merged or they go out of business. That doesn't mean your 401k is gone, by the way. It just means that your old employer is gone. There are many ways to find your previous 401k if your old employer isn't contactable or gone. I'll include a link in the description to a CNBC article which walks you through the steps necessary to locate that 401k. If you like this video, check out that video, How to Live on Social Security Alone. It's one of my most popular. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and turn on notifications so that you get alerted the next time I post a video. I post once or twice a week. This is Jeff Schmidt. Thanks for watching.